Good morning and welcome. I am Grace Maeda the Lailier today, and along with Pastor Carrie Ann and Uncle Anthony, we will be leading this, our worship service this morning. Good morning. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, the season of preparation before Easter. It is good to be together on this slightly chilly morning. <laughs> As we begin our worship together, are there any first-time visitors, family members, or friends to introduce? Let's see, we would like to welcome back Kay Molinar, who is, has been coming in the springtime, right? And it's been a little bit since she's been here, so we're glad to have you back, Kay. Thanks. Later in our worship service, we will have a time for prayers of the people to be shared. Please use this pink sheet located in the p rocks to write down any prayer requests, and it will be collected during the hymn of reflection. Let us continue our time of worship. Please join me in our call to worship by reading the text marked in bold. In the midst of life's storms, God is there. In the dark, darkness and terror, God is with us. Of whom shall we be afraid? Rise up, people of God, for you are loved and saved. Thanks be to God, who cares deeply for us. Amen. Please stand if you are able for our opening hymn. We'll sing four verses of O oh God, Our Hope in Ages Past. Let us come before the Lord in, in prayer and reflection. We will end our prayer by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Mighty God, who speaks a word of peace to calm our troubled sea, we come to you, we come to worship you this day. You are a caring God who nudges us away from fear and toward faith. You are an ever-present God who fills us with awe and wonder. Open our eyes to see you today. Strengthen our hearts for the journey ahead, and open our ears this hour to hear the word you speak. With one voice, as a community of faith followers, faithful followers, we join together to say the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the sharing of our gifts and resources. The ushers will be coming around to collect any monetary offerings, and afterwards we will stand and sing together the doxology. 
We are grateful for the opportunities to share our time and resources so that others may see the light of Christ. We invite the ushers to come forward. Through your generosity, we offer these gifts for the benefit and care of our community so that others may see your light and love. Thank you for your provisions. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. And I'd like to call the Keiki forward. Auntie Susie is leading our Keiki time this morning, and she has a lot off to the side. I wonder what it is. <laughs> Good morning. Well, I can hear myself really well. Wow. Good morning, children, kids, and friends out there. So this morning, I'd like to talk about the concept of church, the building of church here as a sacred space. Do you know what sacred means? Holy. Holy. But what does holy mean? I don't know exactly what holy means, but I did look up the word sacred because I was thinking to myself, sacred, but what does it mean? The short of it, it means connected to God or God. But in our, for my purpose, our here is connected to God. So anything sacred is connected to God. So we can have whatever. Our connection to God is considered sacred. So sometimes like... In church, we'll come in and take off our shoes because we consider church sacred ground. So we take off our shoes and walk in. You look around, you see a couple people in here with no shoes on for that reason. When I was a little girl, church churches, I went to an Episcopal church in Kailua, Oahu called St. Christopher's a little bit here and there, like around seventh grade when we went to confirmation class. But church there was in the kind of the old days, there would be a bunch of ministers up there, and they'd have things on their heads and robes, and like, you know, it was very sacred and scary and what not comfortable at all. And then the other, the other church I've mostly been associated with on a regular basis is this church. And we come in, and we're sacred. We're quiet. Sometimes we take off our shoes. But, you know, sometimes I see kids doing cartwheels down the middle of this church, you know? If you come in on a Tuesday, the whole thrift store is in here. 
all the clothes are rolled in. You know, you just never know. It's a sacred space, but we use it in many ways. Now, it took me a trip to Japan to reconcile that in my head. The old church of the guys up there in robes, and you come in and shh, and no, no making noise, no nothing. And then we went all the way up to northern Japan to our sister church, and they welcomed us in. And I want to show you how they welcomed us in. It's going to be a little, because in those, the first trip to Japan, we didn't have digital cameras, so all our pictures were on cameras. And I, don't, I couldn't find mine, so I'm going to have to reenact what it was like. Okay, it's a little church. We got off the train. They all met us at the station, waving, waving at us. Come, come, come. They picked up our luggage, and we walked down the street to the church. That's how close it was. And then they brought us all into the church like this. And I want to show you how it looked, okay? Okay, pretend you guys are coming in. Come, go stand there and pretend you're coming in, and I'm going to show you about what it was like, okay? We came in, and all this stuff was... Can you guys help me spread this out upside down like it's drying, like your dishes are drying and that's your dish mat. Lay them all out, like you upside down, like you're giant. Yeah. 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 Okay. Come on. Come on over here. Okay. Like we're the group coming in. You guys are coming in. You guys are coming in. I'm the minister and his wife, and you know the people. I'm like, oh hi, we've come all the way from Hawaii now. We're in the trains and getting up there. We're like, we don't even know. And they're coming, in, coming, in, come in. Come on. Oh, come sit down. Come sit down. So over here. Come sit down. Sit down. Relax. Sit down on the pews. We didn't have to sit on the ground. And then. Meanwhile, we're climbing around stuff like this, but oh, excuse us, and they're like this, come on, sit down, sit down, welcome, welcome. And they said, don't mind this. And this little thing here was like all across the front. And they said, oh, don't mind us. We had Thanksgiving the day before. So we washed all our dishes because the sink was outside the church and they had them all drying like that on the inside. <laughs> you know, and we've been to two church services. Okay, you guys can come back. <laughs> We'd been to two church services in Japan, and they're very formal. They don't just go in shorts or jeans. They wear suits, stockings, pumps, you know. And they all take off their shoes outside and put on other shoes and come in. But So in church, it's very sacred, so I was kind of surprised, you know, that this church was... You know, being used as something else in the in the interim, and I, I was really caught off guard. But then, the next day, because we stayed a couple of days up there, we had a church service with them, and the church service was very formal. And we had anthuriums that we'd send up here, and we did this welcome and exchange, and they sing quietly and very solemnly their hymns, and and. Reverend Fujita was really nervous with his sermon because he was trying to give it in English. So he gives it in English, then he gives it in Japanese so everybody else could understand it. And then we were going to get ready to go on the bus and go on to our next destination. But then this solemn church, guess what they did next? Everybody. Well, then they said, okay, go over here and help me. Take this out of the way. This part was all cleaned up, so we take this out of the way. Can you guys set up this table, please? We're still in church now. We so haven't left go church yet. Go over here and set up the table right here. Right here. Kind of like along the bench. Okay, thank you. Maybe in a chair. And you know, can you scoot down? I want to use this bench too. Meanwhile, while we, they were mingling after church, this is what they were doing. So they didn't just set up a table and chairs. They turned all the pews sideways. So they all got up, turned the pews sideways, and got one long picnic table down the middle.
That's what it's like. Scoop up, scoop up, don't mind. Okay. Everybody sit down to the table. Let's have lunch. Okay, let's have lunch, okay? That was really, really fun. <laughs> During our hymn of reflection, you are invited to use the pink sheets in the pews for prayer concerns or joys for yourself or others. The prayer requests will be picked up and, and care, Pastor Care Am will include the prayers of the pastoral prayer. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer as we remain seated and sing four verses of Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
As we come to our time of prayer, uh, I'll be picking up any prayer requests. Are there any other prayer requests we'd like to say out loud as well in this time? I have a couple updates as well. Um, we have uh, for Joni. Um, Joni had um, gamma ray procedure this past week, and it went very smoothly. It was to help shrink a tumor in her brain, which is not cancerous. So she is back home. Yes, praise the Lord for that. And so she is back home, um, and she is recovering well from it. Everything went smoothly. She does also ask for prayers for her brother, Stefan, um, who had a stroke uh, a couple months ago, and she didn't realize how, um, how big it was and how much he had, it affected him. So let's be holding him in prayer. Also, Linda Smith just returned back home last night. Uh, she had back surgery. Um, the pain was pretty intense in her recovery, but the good news is that she has been discharged and is back home. She feels she has a turning point, and that's how she was able to be discharged. So we'll continue to be holding her in prayer. Also, Connie is getting ready for knee surgery. I'm not seeing Connie. <laughs> Oh, she's, she's getting ready for knee surgery. She won't be here uh, the next few Sundays, um, but her surgery is on March 4th. So let's be holding her in prayer. And also, lastly, we have a thank you from Ryder. Um, there's a beautiful card in the back, so see that on your way out. But Ryder, um, Joyce's grandson, um, uh, went through surgery a few weeks ago, and he is back home and doing well. So... It is wonderful to be able to update one another. This is all part of our prayer time and our time as a community as well. So holding those prayers and joys um, and concerns um, upon our hearts, let us continue this time of prayer. <clears throat> oh God, you have made your ways known to us across time and space. Stories abound of your loving care, and we are grateful. Help us not to forget your compassion for all of your children and how you encourage us to approach you with confidence, trusting you with all, that are, all the weights that are heavy on our hearts. God, we entrust to you those who are facing illnesses of body and spirit. May there be caring hands and compassionate hearts who are vessels for your healing. We pray specifically for Joni, for Linda, and for Stefan, and also for Connie, as she prepares for a surgery, Lord, we lift all the prayers that were just mentioned, the requests that were mentioned earlier. We pray also for Kathy, who had a fall last night and is a little banged up, Lord, we just ask for your healing upon her in this time. We pray also, Lord, um, Lord, we also entrust to you those who are lonely and in need of your comfort and peace. May there be glimpses of your goodness in their lives, and may others bring joy to their lives as well. God, we entrust to you the communities in which we live. May your light pour into every corner and help us to reflect your light to others. We come also praying specific prayers of our church community. We pray from Caden, a prayer from Caden, that Daddy Tony's spirit is with us. Be with him in this time of missing him. We pray also for Nani's niece, Lani, and her husband, David, who recently lost their young daughter. We ask for comfort, Lord, and peace. We pray for Anel's father, 92-year-old father, Ricardo Chagola, who is in the hospital due to many ailments. Lord, we ask for your healing and for your presence in the time of healing. We also pray prayers of joy for new ministries that are joining the Hawaii Conference churches. 
Let the work they do be a joy and concerns, and may their concerns be brought before the Lord, before you, God. Lord, we also give a big thanks um, from Lynn um, to her mom and dad for helping her out um, in this season. There's so much that we can praise you for, Lord, and so much more that is upon our hearts, and we lift these to you. God, we praise you for the ways in which you walk with us and remind us of your presence. Continue to strengthen us on this Lenten journey and guide our paths. We thank you for the gift of grace given through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. book of Mark. For today's scripture, we will be reading about Jesus calming the storm from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. You may follow along in your bulletin as you listen to the word of God. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Thanks be to God for the blessing of scripture in our lives. Yes, who is this, right? As the disciples last said in today's passage. Who is this person, this human being who seems to have the power of God Almighty? To the ancient Jewish community, it was understood that, yes, God could control the winds and the waves. And here they have a living person doing the acts of God. Their confusion, questions, and reverence are understandable as they see before their very eyes the power in which Jesus has. This story of Jesus calming the storm is found in all three synoptic gospels. Synoptic means the same. So those three are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're all very similar in the stories that they have and how they present the stories. However, it is Mark's account that is the only one that records Jesus' words. The others say that Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, while this account gives Jesus' words. And if I was to recount this story by memory, I probably would have said that Jesus told the waves, peace, be calm, right? Something along those lines. But as we read it today, we are reminded that he had strength behind his words. He didn't just calm the storm. He called and commanded the storm to stop. As I was studying this passage, I, I kept thinking of parents and grandparents <laughs> in taking care of our children. Right? There's a difference between calming a situation and commanding the situation to stop. Right? Maybe siblings are arguing or they're bouncing off the walls. And first we offer our calming techniques. Right? Please choose something else. Right? Maybe take a break. 
those type of words. But that's different than commanding the situation to stop, right? We might finally say, enough, stop, just be still and be calm. <laughs> That's what kept going through my head when I was uh, reading, first reading through this passage. But with that, the hope is that everyone will stop and listen in that moment and then move into a calmer state of being. This is what Jesus' words are saying. He is first commanding the wind and the waves to stop and then gives a second command that expresses the ongoing state of being calm. Throughout the book of Mark, Jesus' power is very evident. It isn't hidden or implied in the background, but it is there, right in front of everyone. Jesus is commanding the impure spirits to leave. He is confronting the religious leaders about how rigid and confined their religion had become. And here he is, silencing the wind and the waves, exhibiting only, pow only uh, the power that only Yahweh has, God has. This story is a key point in the book of Mark because this is where Jesus' identity is solidified. The disciples asked, who is this person? Well, he is the one with authority as the Messiah, the Son of God. And here he has come to use his authority for good, for the healing of others, to teach, to restore the covenantal relationship once again between God and people. And in today's story, Jesus uses his authority to not only calm the storm, but to calm the fears of the disciples. Yes, Jesus stopped the wind and the waves from sinking the boat. But let's look at what he says to the disciples afterwards. He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Reading these words, I sure wish we could hear the tone of Jesus' voice. Right? And this is a question for ourselves. How do you hear Jesus' voice? when you read scripture? Is it harsh? Is it guilt-ridden? Is it calm and concerned? Over the years, my tone of Jesus has softened. When I read his words, I often hear compassion and a, a more invitational tone instead of one that is confronting and stern but that's all part of our interpretation. For this particular story though, I hear his tone similar to a therapist who is asking their patient a similar question, such as, why does that scare you? As if Jesus is there to explore their fears with them. But coupled with that question is the question about their faith. This one is tricky because he does seem surprised and is calling out their lack of faith. Well, this is a good example of the importance of reading biblical passages in context. And in this case, in the literary context, which is how the author chooses to write out the story. Prior to this story, we read about Jesus' teachings on faith, which he gave through parables. Right? Parables are stories that are relatable with good analogies that are helpful to those whom he's speaking to. Right? And they, there's a message within it. So an example would be the tortoise and the hare for us. Right? It's an analogy to help us understand a lesson. So Jesus spoke in parables. Well, prior to this story of Jesus and the storm, in chapter 4, we have three parables. The parable of the sower, the parable of the growing seed, and the parable of the mustard seed, all of which talk about faith. These parables express the importance of first having a deep faith that is rooted in God so that it can stay strong. That's the parable of the sower. 
along with the recognition that we have faith because God is working even when we can't see it. That's the parable of the growing seed. And finally, in the parable of the mustard seed, Jesus teaches that it doesn't take much to have faith. It can start as something small, and it will grow. After these three parables comes the story of Jesus commanding the storm to stop. This story is the culmination of Jesus' authority while also expressing the importance of having a deeply rooted, secure faith in God. When we read it in context, we can see the primary messages that the author was trying to communicate. Jesus' questions to the disciples, asking why are, are, what are they afraid of and about their faith, are important because there are storms in life. And Jesus is asking, what is stopping you from having faith through these storms? What are you afraid of when you are in the midst of crashing waves and the rushing wind? For the disciples, they were probably afraid of dying in that storm. Now, they aren't being overly dramatic in this storm, <laughs> in this story. Storms on the Sea of Galilee can be pretty intense and can pick up rather quickly. I've seen it when I was in Israel. We were on the Sea of Galilee and the water was calm and peaceful. The boat was rocking slowly as we moved along the water. But then just a couple hours later, we were up on the hillside and the winds had picked up. We were looking down on the Sea of Galilee and the boats were just rocking back and forth. And the weather had changed so quickly and the boats on this large lake felt the effects of it. So this story isn't physically unreasonable as far as a, a storm coming up quickly. However, on the other hand, going back to our disciples, many of them were fishermen and probably knew the Sea of Galilee pretty well. They knew how to navigate the winds and, and what to do when the waves were crashing onto the deck of a relatively small fishing boat. This is where their question to Jesus is rather interesting. They cried out to Jesus saying, teacher, don't you care if we drown? They aren't asking, are you going to save us? But instead, they're asking, don't you care about us and what we have to go through? Right? This is honest and real. How often people cry out to God saying, don't you care, God? Where are you? And that actually becomes one of the most pivotal questions of our faith. Does God really care? When the book of Mark was written, the people were crying out to God probably in the same way. This gospel account was written around the time of extreme Christian persecution led by the Roman Emperor Nero. Peter and Paul were most likely executed by Nero, and there is fear just flowing through the Christian communities with valid reasons. The people were crying out, don't you see us, God? Aren't you concerned with what we're going through? The question that the disciples asked are reflective of their time, the time in which it was written, but also relatable throughout history and also for us right now. In our darkest times, our honest thoughts and prayers could be asking, where is God when there is so much suffering and difficulties? And more personally, where is God when I am suffering and going through difficulties? This story is real and relevant. We want God's power to be prevalent. For God to command the storms of our life to stop. We don't want to go through storms. 
but the reality is, is that storms do happen. And Jesus is getting to the heart of things by addressing the fears that are present in the midst of the storms. See, having faith does not mean that we don't have storms in our life. And we, we actually have to be careful not to make this association. Otherwise, every difficulty in our life will be put back on us that our faith isn't strong enough. Or, on the flip side, when we are faithful, we have an expectation that life will just be easy and smooth sailing with everything provided for. So basically, the strength of our faith is equivalent to how prosperous we are. Which means we need to have more faith in order to have no storms in our life. But that doesn't always work out, does it? The storms still come. And faith isn't a transaction where I do this and therefore I get that. The biblical example of all of this is the book of Job, where he was an extremely faithful man, and yet he lost everything. Instead, according to Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Then the chapter goes on to talk about all the people in the past who exhibited faith. This type of hope, confidence, and assurance. Right? There's people such as Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Rahab, and so on. Well, did they all have an easy life? <laughs> nope. They had storms in their life. I mean, Noah had to literally get through an actual storm, right, for 40 days. <laughs> But having faith does not equal a storm-free life. As a reminder, though, we don't have to have much. Our faith can be as small as a mustard seed, but our faith helps us to be confident that God is working, even when we may not see it. Maybe Jesus asked the disciples what they are afraid of, because their fears were hindering them. Maybe all they could see were their fears, and therefore they cried out, Don't you care, Jesus? Jesus doesn't rebuke their fear. He asks them why they are afraid, especially when they have the option of having faith in a powerful, almighty, loving God. Maybe Jesus is asking, why are you afraid instead of having faith? These are tough questions. But during the season of Lent, I would encourage us to reflect on it. What are your fears and storms in your life? There is space for us to express our fears as we journey with the Lord. For example, this prayer station is also a place that you can name those fears and place them on the cross throughout the season of Lent. Or as we talked about the Sabbath last week, during your Sabbath time, talk about, talk about the storms you are facing with the Lord. Fears aren't necessarily bad or wrong. I mean, healthy levels of fear actually help us to be aware of danger, right? So we can't say that all fear is bad. However, we can reflect on the fears that may cripple us. We can answer Jesus' question, and we can be honest as we journey with God. What are the fears that hinder our faith or cause us to be reactive or make rash decisions because we're trusting on our own efforts and not trusting in the Lord. There is room for us to express our fears, and God can handle it. As we work through our fears, we will find that our faith increases, but in a way that really trusts God, God's timing, God's decisions, God's plans, and how God uses his power and authority. God can command the storms of life to stop, but when we put our trust and faith in God, it means that we are also trusting when and how God uses his power. Through faith, 
We are releasing how we think it should be, how God should do things, and then trusting that God is present, even though there are storms. So what are the fears and anxieties that you are facing? Or what do you feel you will face in the future? What do you need to give to the Lord or talk with God about during this Lenten season? We're going to take a few moments to reflect on this. Anthony is going to play a little bit for us. And if you would like, there's also space in your worship bulletin to write down any notes. But let the Spirit guide your thoughts as we come before the Lord, offering our fears and anxieties and the storms in our lives. faith be greater than our fears so that we can get through the hard, hard storms of life. May we have the assurance that God is present and as the scripture said that God does care. Amen. The song we'll be singing next is written by, was written by a man of faith who also experienced a lot of tragedy. Horatio Spafford lost huge amounts of property in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. He and his wife also lost a son to sickness, and then they lost all of their daughters when their ship sank on the way to England. He had lost so much, and yet, in his grief, he wrote this song when he sailed over the part of the ocean where the ship sank. He is a reminder, this song is a reminder, that our faith can help us to be able to say, it is well with my soul. We will remain seated as we sing three verses of this beautiful song.
As we close our worship service, we are reminded how important it is to be in community with one another on this faith journey. We are glad each of you are here today, and thank you, Uncle Andy, for today's beautiful music. To know what's happening in the life of our church, Johanna, please see the worship bulletin for more information. We are gearing up for the big 130th celebration at the end of March, and a lot of preparations are happening. For the celebration, we are having a community market on Saturday, March 23rd, and we are looking for vendors to participate. If you know of anyone, there are flyers and a vendor form in the back of the chapel. The celebration will be an exciting weekend. There are flyers for the event also in the back of the chapel. Are there any other announcements to share? We have uh, Nicole, who is a college student who's away at college in Portland, and uh, we'll be sending her a box of goodies from us. So there is a card in the back if you just want to write a little note. If the card gets filled up, there are also um, note cards if you want to do a separate note, but we'll put all of that into her box and be sending it off this week. So that's in the back there. Thanks. Thank you for the many ways all of you participate in the life of our church, Johanna, during the week and on Sunday mornings. Let's close our time together through song and then our friendship circle. Those who are able, please stand as we sing three verses of Just a Closer Walk with Thee. gather around the chapel for a closing circle and benediction. This circle reminds us that we are not on this journey alone, that we go together, whether near or far, and that is the beautiful part of community and being rooted together in Christ. As we go forward, though, may we continue to be rooted and established in love so that together we may grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. The Lord is with you. 
Amen. Amen.